Next up on This Week in Law, it's back to school time, but instead of hitting the books, we're going to hit the tunes with two law professors who are also music industry insiders, Professor Lauren Mulrain, Professor Ramona DeSalvo. Evan Brown and I are here, too. We're going to talk about Axl Rose, Kanye West, Pirates, Nietzsche, and lots more, all next on the show. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. And with for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell and Evan Brown. Episode 176, recorded August 24, 2012. Console Jungle. Enhance your workflow. Send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today. For a 30-day free trial, go to ShareFile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter the promo code TWILL. Hi, folks. It's Denise Howell here, and you've tuned in for This Week in Law for our back-to-school edition of the show, where we're going to, instead of hitting the books, we're going to hit the music. We've got a couple of great law professors, both from Nashville, Tennessee, uh, one, of course, of the hubs of the music industry, uh, Professor Lauren Mulrain from Belmont University College of Law is joining us today. Hello, Professor Mulrain. Hello. Nice to be with you today. Nice to be with you too. Professor Mulrain uh, teaches our summer intern who has uh, stopped his stint with us but gone back to school as a 2L and uh, is fortunate enough to have Professor Mulrain as a teacher in intellectual property and entertainment law issues. So we're thrilled to have you on the show today. Thank you. Also joining us uh, is, I believe, a good friend of Professor Mulrain's colleague from a college uh, just down the road, the Nashville School of Law, Ramona DeSalvo. Hi. Great to have you on today, Ramona. Thank you. Good to be with you. And of course, joining us from Chicago, Illinois, is Evan Brown. Hello, Evan. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, of course I'm here. I love to show up anytime I'm asked, and uh, it's great to uh, great to see you, Denise, and looking forward to our conversation. Me too. I'm really looking forward to our conversation because we have a lot of folks on the show who are technology lawyers or technology law professors. Every now and then, we have someone on who specializes in practicing in the entertainment industry, but I don't know that we've ever had to what I would consider music industry insiders on at the same time. So uh, this is a real treat for us, and we have um, some great stories to address with them. So let's not delay any longer. Let's take a trip out to Hollywood and talk about it. Talk about some entertainment law stories. Uh, So what I wanted to discuss right off the bat is sort of a big and meaty topic. Um, There were a couple of good pieces this week, one from Nick Milton in the New York Times, one from David Pogue in Scientific American, both on uh, infringement and workarounds for uh, anything that is put in place to stop illegal downloading or consumption of copyrighted material. Uh, Nick Bilton's piece is called Internet Pirates Will Always Win. And uh, David Pogue's is How Hollywood is Encouraging Online Piracy. Um, So I wanted to get into uh, with the two professors uh, the whole question of of this cat and mouse game that gets played. Um, uh, Nick Bilton has his piece basically takes the tack of um, this is all a game of whack-a-mole that, you know, immediately... When you pound down one mole, uh, maybe three more pop up in its place. When you leave the arcade playing the game, uh, you've usually lost, but at least the game ends. And here it just never really seems to. Um, he, he gives a couple of examples um, talking about the YouTube content ID system that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, when people want to evade that, uh, there's a funny little ruse that they've been 
going through that uh, basically prevents the content ID system from detecting that a video that's rolling uh, might be copyrighted material and get caught in their fingerprinting system. And that is, it's a picture of a cat. I think we have a picture of that cat uh, watching an old JVC television. And uh, they just managed to, I'm not quite sure technically how you managed to do this, but you know, you put the video inside the television and then you're you're good to go. And the content ID system sees it as just the picture of the cat watching TV. Um, I think, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a picture of a cat. It could be, you know, a web page with the video rolling inside uh, might give you a leg up on the content ID. I know that, you know, we've, we've endeavored to do that uh, here at the Twit Network. I'm not sure how well it works. Um, so Nick's point is that, you know, on and on we go and, you know, you shut down one pirate bay and thousands more spring up in its wake, as it were. Um, so going first to you, Professor Mulrain, you're both a musician and a, a scholar in this area. Um, what do you think about all of this and, and the state of the current business models for the entertainment industry? Well, I certainly think that uh, Nick Bilton's piece was very well written and very provocative. And it's something we've been dealing with in the music industry uh, for the better part of 12 or 13 years now, where we um, have tried to struggle with dealing with the advantages and disadvantages simultaneously of advanced technology. Now, one of my common refrains that I share with my students is that it seems as though technology's advancements have hurt every industry except the technological industry. So we, you know, we've been able now to make music more available, but it hurts those who own the um, the copyrights and um, and, and truly the, the whack-a-mole um, analogy is, is a good one because we every time we find a way to, to shut down one source of, of infringement another one pops up um, if we knew what we could do to fix the business model um, certainly that would that would uh, solve the problem quickly but it's, it's an ongoing challenge and you know I tell my students that in many regards, that makes this the most exciting time to come into the business from the legal perspective, um, not so much from the artistic perspective, because as an artist, you're, you're losing control um, much more often than you would like to. Um, the whole concept of when we used to, used to use that phrase, file sharing, which, you know, I, I abhorred that phrase because we weren't really sharing if somebody's taking something you didn't offer to them. But um, the thing with that is, I have no problem at all with someone sharing something that they own and they decide to give to the community freely. The problem is when someone else says, hey, I've got a way to get around or to circumvent um, protection measures to take this, which is not mine. And that's that's the biggest problem. OK, uh, Professor DeSalvo, um, I remember uh, Franklin sent me um, a clip that, of an interview that you had done uh, where you were talking about um, educating your students about copyright and how you would ask them, you know, if they had engaged in piracy and you would hope that by the end of your course, they, they might change their ways. You might be able to convince them that that wasn't such a good idea. Um, how, how do you think you're doing with that? They're going to take it anyway. Regardless, <laughs> um, that is one thing I did learn from them. But what I think what they learned was um, I'm not. Te I was teaching in the recording industry department at Middle Tennessee State University, where mm -hmm. it's a, a four year degree in recording industry, and so it was both on the audio side and then also on the business side as well as commercial songwriting. And a lot of the people that were in the program were creative people, so it would be their works that would be taken. But once they learned the revenue streams. And and how the industry is structured. It seemed to be okay to steal everybody else's material, but when it came to theirs, they were very proprietary about it because they wanted to make music. Initially, it's okay to give it away to attract an audience, and then once it's once you have your audience, then they want to get paid for it because how else are they going to make a living at it? Um, I thought they... Uh, I'm glad... Uh, Dr. Mulrain went first because he sounds like the voice of reason when you compared to me when it comes to protection of copyright. Most people know that I represent 
uh, songwriters, music publishers, small independent record labels, independent artists, and I'm quite militant about copyright and uh, the protection of owners' rights. And so as I read this article that uh, that we're discussing now, that Nick Bilton had written, um, I thought the conclusion said, "Well, the uh, the the people who are whacking those really slow mallets in the whack a mole mm-hmm. game have right. to realize that there is time better spent playing a completely different game." Well, the question is, what is that? You know, and that has been. Excuse me. Uh, that's been the toughest part for people to figure out is the people who don't own the content, as Dr. Moraine said, are the people who are making the money. The people who are the creative folks that are the content owners or who have assigned their rights to the content um, are losing more and more. So uh, I thought the philosophy was interesting. It seems like it's more, much more of a tech side written in this article. Even though well written, it just said, well, if the movie industry doesn't give us what we want or when we want it, we're just going to go take it. And you can't stop us. And if you try to stop us, we're just going to go around you. Um, the owners of co- those copyrights have a limited monopoly, and it is limited for a period of time where they can actually make a living at it. Uh, I've been able to, by the end of... Uh, some of my students have had my, you know, had me for more than one semester, and then know about my involvement in the industry. And then I think many of them, in answer to your question, had a greater appreciation for copyright and uh, afterwards. But most of them still will continue to pirate wherever they can. Free is always better than having to pay, and that's just the mentality. And if you were raised, dig- you were born digital not just raised digital, but born that way, it's one of those things that's hard to change. It's going to be very hard to change. And the industry, I think, has made amazing strides in the last decade. I, I started in Napster. You know, I was in the Napster right. litigation. And so it's, uh, we've done, um, had amazing strides in terms of coming up with new ways to license things. But it just, when it comes to the movie industry, there doesn't seem to be a way to make the consumer happy uh, that yeah, I, think I think so that, far. That's why the whack-a-mole right. continues. Right. I, I think and it's I think interesting. For, to, go ahead, Evan. Actually, I'm sorry. Was that Lauren? That was, that was professor. Right. Sorry. Right. I was just going to say that I, I think um, for a while we were able to escape the, um, the film industry was able to escape this being a problem because of bandwidth being an issue. But now mm-hmm. that that's no longer an issue, the film industry is having the same concerns that the music industry has had for so many years. Right. It seems to me that in all of the entertainment industries for a long time, scarcity was a large part of the business model. Um, And that plays into your bandwidth comment. You know, if things are scarce because they're difficult to get at because of bandwidth issues, uh, that's one thing. But even in legal authorized ways, it seems like, Scarcity is a big part of the entertainment business model. We're going to window things. We're going to only release um, certain of our catalog. We're going to charge higher prices than the market wants to bear. Um, so it definitely has depended on on a scarcity model. And and as you pointed out, Professor Mulrain, as the internet advances and technology advances and people get more and more determined... Uh, that scarcity business model just doesn't seem to work well anymore. Um, that that perhaps it's time to figure out, you know, as you say, the music industry has done a, a good job in the last uh, dozen or so years of moving forward uh, toward making things uh, cheap and easy, if not, you know, finding a way to make free a business model. Um, so I'm I'm not... I, like you, am at an impasse for, you know, where things go next. Uh, It's not clear that laws are capable of eliminating free as a de facto uh, distribution method. Um, It's not clear that the public is behind enacting laws that can come close to doing that, as we saw with SOPA getting shot down. Um, So I'm wondering, Professor DeSalvo, um, what sort of thought processes are going on on your side of the table to address all this? Well, we have uh, different industry groups that meet. Uh, I'm part of a Music Row Administrators group, which are independent licensing of musical compositions of 
everyone other than the major music publishers. And we we have been meeting regularly for the last, well, since 98 and coming up with different ideas on how we can license more creatively. And, and it's not um, – music isn't that expensive to license legally. It's just that people simply – if the option is free, they don't want to be bothered. Although I must say that the trend has been – to more payment and for more licensing of music. However, I can still see um, there. So there is an improvement. It isn't like Napster, Grokster days, or Aimster days, uh, but there has been a lot more uh, done in terms of licensing. The problem is, is now even though we're licensing, we're getting little tiny micro pennies of money. You know, I get a check for one cent every now and then. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and you can see on a royalty statement where uh, a songwriter can have, you know, by units, two, two hundred thousand of something and see 40 cents next to it when it comes to streaming. So that model hasn't been figured out yet. We really can't figure out how to do the streaming where people can get paid or the streaming of music in video where uh, you're going to see payment on the songwriter and the publishing end of it. Uh, although I, I must say it, it has improved because at least now you're seeing micro pennies, whereas before it was just a zero for, because of the stealing. So I think that, uh, and, and I do consider it to be stealing uh, when, if you don't like you don't like what the price is of something, you just go in and take it. That mentality doesn't resonate with me, but apparently does with a lot of digital folks that think it's okay to do that. Um, and then, of course, everybody does it, so it's, it becomes acceptable. It becomes a norm. But I think yeah. the industry really has done its best to try to license music more, and that is more and more what I see is interesting ways of getting that music out there and getting the people to accept that there is a price, even if it is small, to be paid for the music for the creative industry. Yeah, I think that's the sweet spot, is if there is a way that it you know, is, is not a huge... Uh, mental gymnastic hurdle to get through uh, for someone to be able to license a piece of music. It seems to me like in the past, uh, maybe the music industry and the television and movie industries as well um, looked at licensing as something that they wanted to do to large economic parties as opposed to, you know, what's more and more the case today, um, small individuals or small entrepreneurs that want to you know, put their works to use. But when they look at the licensing models that are available, you know, I mean, just on this show, uh, Evan and I are both lawyers. We know people who are music industry lawyers, but to go out and actually, um, you know, jump through the hoops of getting licensed music for the show, it was much easier for us and and where we wound up going to get something that was... Um, actually not something where we had to go through the ASCAP BMI process, Fox, good knows, goodness knows, you know, I just don't even know what else is out there. Um, our friend Colette Vogel did a whole podcasting legal guide that attempts to uh, walk people who do these sorts of shows <laughs> through the actual licensing process. Uh, but we just went ahead and got something that was licensed for all kinds of commercial use, et cetera, and, and made sure that we, you know, we had the rights directly uh, from the musician who does our, our theme show, our theme song music. So um, I, I think that well, there's probably, Denise, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead. What I was going to say too, that's probably part of the advantage of having uh, the accessibility to all types of music now, because mm-hmm. there are plenty of artists out there, plenty of folks out there, you find them on the internet that want to give their music away. You know, right. the, the tease, you know, we're going to give you a couple of tracks and particularly uh, for purposes of advertising themselves or, you know, any kind of commercial use in, in television or film or anything where it could catch a listener's ear and that person goes, hey, who is that? Maybe actually takes the time right. to read the credits and then go to their website and turns them on to uh, 
all of the other music that they have available. So free, I said in that video that you referenced earlier, free is not a business model because nobody makes any money, but free can be a type of business model, particularly for the DYI folks out there that are really, we have so much music and now we have to have the audience know where to find the music because it's, you know, it's just saturated. So you have to find the right music that you're looking for and how do you develop that fan base and free works for that purpose. It, it actually does work. I don't think it would work for somebody like Universal does, or Sony, but it does work for the independent artists and some of these small independent record labels trying to get their artists out there. Yep. Nigel Clutterbuck does our theme music and we're very grateful to him for licensing his tracks to us for that purpose. Um, Evan, you've been kind of quiet here. Do you have any thoughts on all this? Well, as you know, I'm, I've kind of just hang out in the moderate space on most of these issues. And, you know, I used to think that it would be much easier to just be extreme on on the spectrum of issues because then all you have to do is throw rocks at the other side to support your position. But actually, it's easiest to be a moderate because you can throw rocks at either sides of an issue. So that's <laughs> that's where I am on all this. I mean, uh, for the, I think the, probably the most interesting phenomenon I see on all of this is piracy as a sociological phenomenon where those who are so into piracy and piracy for piracy's sake and all of that stuff, they do it and lose sight of the real reason of why they're doing it and certainly lose sight of any analysis that has to do with intellectual property. On the other side of that spectrum, I would put um, uh, you know, those who are very pro IP and strict IP enforcement type of, type of people um, – you know, this might I, – I, I don't want to, to, you know, go around putting labels on anything. But I know this is where Professor DeSalvo and I, you know, may, may differ a little bit in our sensibilities because I think that when people are militant about intellectual property rights uh, or, or, you know, care, you know I, I certainly would not characterize it as stealing. I think that, that mischaracterizes what intellectual property infringement is. It's more in the nature of a trespass than it is a, a, a theft. You know, I, that – seems to put me in mind often it's easy to to go down the path of of intellectual property rights holders attempting to extract more value from what it is they're creating than what they are releasing into the world um just kind of as an aside you know leo laporte had a conversation with tim o'reilly on triangulation a couple days ago and so i've really been thinking of the world in terms of you know, putting value out there and then uh, getting value back. And it's generally better if the value that you give to the world is, is a little bit more than, than what, you, what you bring into yourself. And so strict IP enforcement folks tend to cross that line where, you know, with every little use of their work somewhere that may or may not be authorized, you know, it's like go to court and get a TRO and file a lawsuit and seek the maximum statutory damages. You know, that's that's crossing that line where the value they're trying to, to get is uh, much more than what they're giving to the world. So what I would like to see in an ideal world, you know, as I said, hanging out here in the moderate space in the middle somewhere is a system of regulation and sensibilities about intellectual property that take into account the incentives that can be given to creative people for, for creating works, as well as innovation in the space uh, of, of technology that allows the distribution. Uh, and in all of this, a real good, fair, reasonable treatment of notions and sensibilities like fair use and the ways that works can be incorporated without running afoul of the sledgehammer of, of uh, IP owners coming their way in a way that fosters remix culture and, and those types of things. That's how... Um, that's how the, the ideal world would look to me, a, a nice balancing of these uh, sensibilities without getting too extreme on, on, either, on either side of it. Professor Mulrain, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, the music industry has been sort of at the vanguard of all of this, of the entertainment areas, uh, in that they've had to deal with it first and have probably dealt with it best uh, as far as uh, now we have non-DRM'd versions of just about every track that someone might want to acquire, uh, readily downloadable for a pretty reasonable price. Um, do you think that that has solved the industry's problems or is there still a long way to go? Well, I think that although you're probably accurate in saying that we've been successful recently, it, it was a long time coming and there were a lot of growing pains that led to to the, the successes that, that the industry is having right now. 
But to, to answer the, the tail end of your question, no, it hasn't really solved the problem because um, the industry is still hemorrhaging with regard to uh, loss of income from sources that used to be revenue sources. And, mm -hmm. and as, uh, you know, as you know, in, corporate, in the corporate world, the person who takes the hit usually is the, uh, the one who has the least control, which in most cases is the artist. So the record mm -hmm. companies have uh, turned, they're going to find a way to make a profit. And the way that they've decided to make a profit is to tap into more of the revenue streams that the artists typically were able to retain. And now those streams are um, being shared with the record label, whereas they weren't before. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting, too, how the, the character of piracy in our culture has changed from the Napster days. I think, you know, we might have this image left over from those times of the of Sean Fanning in his dorm room and, you know, other students just kind of scratching their rebellious itch and deciding, you know, heck yeah, we're going to do this because we can. But I, th I think it's really changed. There was an interesting stat uh, in one of these articles, the David Pogue piece, um, traffic to illegal download sites has more than sextupled since 2009, and file downloading is expected to grow about 23% annually until 2015. Why? Of the 10 most pirated movies of 2011, guess how many of them are available to rent on rent online as I write this in midsummer 2012? Zero, he writes. So that's a problem. What, yeah. And, and what culturally, what I see that doing just anecdotally among the people around me, you know, friends and neighbors and upstanding pillars of society, not kids in dorm rooms, uh, the frustration level of not being able to get what they want when they want it and having, you know, waited so long for this to get figured out causes them to, you know, construct their own system where they have what they want when they want it. And these are, you know, people with money to burn who would spend that money on a cheap, easy system if one were available for them. Um, so, you know, I think that leaving the money on the table, as far as the movie industry is concerned, you know, as you say, they're, they're still hemorrhaging in the music industry, but, but they've got to be hemorrhaging more, don't you think? They certainly have more to lose. Yeah. Because when you talk about the, the investment that's made in a typical recording, you know, you're talking about in, in a major deal, hundreds of thousands of dollars. When you're talking about a movie, you can't even start filming a movie with hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh, the amount of money that's at stake is really um, it's certainly uh, much, more, uh, much more dangerous ground that they're on if, if this thing doesn't get under control. Um, one thing also I wanted to touch on that kind of taps into what Evan was saying was his um, moderate approach. I think the key is having the artist or the rights owner retain some control. Rights owners don't necessarily care about every single use being licensed for money, but they just want to know that at least they're giving it away, knowing they're giving it away. For example, there are a lot of networks on the cable side now who are doing sync licenses with artists to have their songs played in various portions of shows. And those sync licenses aren't generating any income, but they're promoting the artist by saying what you're listening to right now is. And so that's a trade off that adds value, even though there's not a, a check being exchanged. Right. right. And it would be even, I mean, the, the way we've got to make that happen is to make that, um, you know, make, make that make that easier so that when people take that next step of, um, you know, either making it easy to, to go and purchase that music or if they want to license it for their own use to make that much easier. And I think this harkens back to what we were talking about and what the point Denise was making. It's like if I wanted to license something for a project I'm working on, I ha it, it's it's completely Byzantine of where to get all the different licenses for the composition sure. or for the sound recording or whatever, even for someone, you know, I, who – has a broadband internet connection and can you know do web searches fine it's it's so it's so hard hard to do so there's just got to be some kind of reduction in the friction and and the, the you know all the uh, hurdles and and uh, things that that a person has to jump over to make these things happen to really fully exploit the work in a way whether that be um, through through licensing or just subsequent purchase yeah I would right. agree with that 
Absolutely. And as Lauren was saying, full employment act for the attorneys involved. If either of you, we do a resource of the week at the end of the show and I have one queued up, but if either of you has a good music licensing resource you want to share with us, you know, chime in at any time because I'm sure people uh, would love to hear about how to make that easier, more friction free for them. So let us know if anything pops to mind. Well, it seems right. easy to me because I work in it all the time. And it, if, right. you, if you're not familiar with it, it's very, it's foreign. But uh, you mentioned ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. You can go to any mm -hmm. one of the, their websites. Okay. BMI usually has a, has a broader database that also includes the ads, ASCAP songs. Find out who owns it. It gives you the phone number, the email address, the contact information. You email them and ask. And that's generally for a mechanical license because uh, BMI and ASCAP license public performance. And you don't license generally public performance directly. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you want to record a song, you just go there. You find out who the publisher is and you contact them. You only need to contact one of them um, if it's the song's already been out there, has been used before. Or you go to the Harry Fox Agency and look there for a mechanic. You can get... You know, they have the small licenses for, you know, 2,500 units or less. You can get your digital licenses there. And Harry Fox has thousands and thousands of songs because they represent Universal and Sony and Warner. And they've got all of the major publishers in there. So you can find almost anything you're looking for. Do a small project. Go on there. Pay with your credit card in advance. You know, you may want to do 500 units or 100 units. Uh, you can do that online real easily. Uh, but I think people aren't aware of that. But it's very user-friendly. It's intuitive. You don't have to know about music licensing. You just follow the prompts and it tells you what to do. Um, but if I could just say one thing. When I... Sure. Uh, the militancy thing. I didn't want to scare anybody by saying that. I'm militant in terms of educating people about owner's rights, uh, how to teach uh, people who own copyrights what to do with them. A lot of folks don't even know. A lot of creative people just create and they don't even know how to protect their own works. Yeah, I'm not that crazy person that wants to go after everybody in every single use. But as Lauren said, you want to know what's out there, how it's being used. But at the same time, if somebody is commercially exploiting your song and making money and doing something with it that would otherwise have been a right of yours to license and earn some money from it. Uh, you know, there isn't that much money in a mechanical license. It's 9.1 cents for all songwriters and all publishers for a single track. So if I co-write a song and you, you take my song without licensing it, for every copy you make, I lose four and a half cents. Four and a half cents is not too much to pay. Nine cents is nine point one cents isn't too much to pay. I think the other, and I think people aren't aware of that. They think it costs them a lot of money. If you make a thousand units, you're not talking about very much money. So if you just pay that licensing fee, it saves you a whole lot more trouble. And if you end up with a willful copyright infringement case where you could be looking at $150,000 um, in damage, $150,000 in damages, even if you didn't make any money, because the act of the infringement of the taking is what's being punished by those statutory damages. So even if you do it innocently or you say, oh, the defense is, well, I didn't make any money, uh, it doesn't matter. Had you just asked for the license, it would have been a whole lot less expensive in the first instance to do that. So that's where my militancy lies more in educating people and then protecting creative people so they know how to take care of their works and license their works. Because many people are just busy creating and not even taking care of the business side of it at all. And then they wonder why they don't make any money. That's true. Yeah, I don't know. I've, a couple of people in the chat room are kind of echoing what I'm thinking, and that is – Yes, the, the various agencies that you mentioned are out there and they have forms that you can go through, but it still just seems really hard. I mean, to know, I don't even know what a unit is <laughs> when you toss that out there. So, I mean, I think it's hard. And I, you know, I've had these courses. <laughs> so I think that um, I, that for the layperson to try and navigate all that, it's, it's really, really hard. Uh, and I'm wondering as a follow-up, uh, whether you've heard any proposals for sort of scrapping the current licensing system and imposing a tax or some kind of ISP, extra ISP fee, there are all sorts of these proposals floating out there. If any of those seem to make any sense to you. I think uh, scrapping the compulsory licensing uh law, Section 115 of the Copyright Act, has been the thing that has been most talked about because that mm -hmm. it's been there since 1909, and nobody uses it anyway. 
It's a hassle, a very tiny, small fraction of the industry uses it, and they generally don't use it correctly anyway when they do it. And um, so I think even the Copyright Office uh, had suggested that we scrap the compulsory licensing provisions, but in the alternative, then what do you have? You still have the old licensing structure and you know, the same type of payment, the same type of rates until we can come up with a different tax. I don't know that the tax is going to work you know, it, it, unless it all turns into a sort of blanket licensing uh, for mechanical reproduction. And, and the problem with blanket licensing, for example, is you, know, you just pay one flat licensing fee and you can use whatever song you want. It's the little guy that gets hurt in that scenario. So you may have one song that does well in your whole career, but then you're competing against you know, Gaga and the Beatles and you know, everybody else who is making tons of money at it. And in a blanket licensing scheme, the little guy generally doesn't see any money. That's true in public performance right now that operates on a blanket licensing scheme. Your song can be played in a club seven nights a week and you'll never get any money out of it unless you start breaking through and really selling units, which are the individual uh, digital albums or physical albums that you're selling or by track on on iTunes or any of the other services. So uh, there really hasn't been an alternative that sounds appealing that could actually be implemented, I don't think, anytime in the next three years at least, maybe five to ten years down the road. I just haven't heard any let alternatives. Me another, let me add another piece to that discussion. Sure. Though. I, I don't think that the real problem lies in the little guy licensing a mechanical for an album that's going to sell a thousand or two thousand copies. I think most of those folks actually do try to do it the right way. The problem as far as where the money is really being lost is in the rogue Pirateers who don't care what the regulations are. So what we're really talking about here is, you know, how many locks do I need to put on my door to protect my home from law-abiding folks? None, right? Mm -hmm. The locks are really to protect you against those who are going to break however many locks you put on your door. And that's what we're really looking at here. The, the little guy who, you know, and I understand, Denise, and I totally understand the concept of it being sometimes difficult to navigate, but those who decide they're going to be in the business and want to make records, they find a way to figure out how to do it, whether it's somebody who's advising them, an attorney or so on, and they can get it done. The problem is those who don't care about it. You know, you, you put your show together and you knew that you had to speak to somebody to get rights to do music. And however you did that, whether it was somebody who was going to license it for free or whether it was some, someone who was going to charge you, you know, a hefty amount, that was up to you, but you knew that there had to be some steps taken, and you were going to take those steps because you're a law-abiding citizen. The problem sure. is in those who don't care. Right. And, and to the extreme, I mean, those who, like I was saying earlier, who want to engage in piracy for the sake of piracy. The best analogy I can think of is like this phenomenon we have in the 21st century of people being famous for being famous. You know, like, right. like Paris Hilton or... Prince Harry. Well, I guess <laughs> Prince Harry is famous for other reasons. But, yeah, yeah, there you go. Never mind. Maybe my analogy breaks down. A naked <laughs> prince, too. <laughs> oh, I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> okay. Well, just scantily clad, right? Or did he manage to lose it all? I think he, wasn't, he, he was, didn't have much left on. All right. He was covered you guys by gonna... TMZ, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are going to have to bring me up to speed on that one. Maybe after we covered by finish the lofty copyright discussion. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, let's let's move on from uh, from how people manage to get their whole copies of songs, television shows, and uh, uh, movies to um, what we were talking about a minute ago: remix culture and and um, making new creations off of what has come before. And and before I get to um, this sampling story involving hip hop artist Lord Finesse and rapper Dan Bull. Let me just ask you both this this one question before we leave the the ten thousand foot view, um, and I'll put it to both of you. Copyright term too long or too short? Certainly, um, a lot of people think that it has gotten v very long in the tooth. 
Yeah, it's life of the last surviving author plus 70 years. Mm -hmm. So if you co-write with a 10-year-old, <laughs> you know, that's going to be in copyright for a very long time. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of works, you know, that are under the old law, the 1909 Act, where you have a 28-year term and a 28-year renewal. They got some extensions, of course, uh, so that would be on par with those that are under the uh, 76 Act. Um, it is long. It is long, but people are living longer. It costs more money to make music. Uh, it costs a lot of money to make movies, as Lauren pointed out also just a few minutes ago. And so you want to give that owner and that creator, whether it's the economic author through a work for hire or the creative author, the right to exploit that and to benefit when that copyright um, actually develops that value. You know, the, the guy who wrote Winnie the Pooh, didn't know that Winnie the Pooh was going to be as successful as it was. And so you sometimes have to wait for the duration of the lifetime of that copyright to reap any value. You know, you always hear about the starving artists, and that's not just in the music industry, but the starving, you know, painter who doesn't, who only becomes famous after his death. Well, that's true in the music industry, too. We've got a lot of these guys, or just think about the guys who had hits in the 60s and are still trying to live off those songs in 2012, you know, with pennies trickling in over the years. So um, there is a way to use the existing music by licensing it. And then I don't think it is too long because uh, the whole concept, and this came over even from England, uh, you know, where we got our copyright law, was life of the author and then to benefit the author and the author's family. Uh, because copyrights are signed away before you really knew the value to the ruination of the author. That's in the statute of Anne and the, and the author's family. So this, this gives the author's family uh, a right to gain some of the benefit of copyrights, which may, may not mature. The true value may not mature till much later in the author's life. Um, I think it's about as long as it could possibly go at this point. I don't think mm -hmm. it's going to be extended further because some copyrights are lasting, you know, 100, 100, 200, almost close to 200 years. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Depending upon the life of the last author. And under the former act, it's 95 years. It mathematically works out to be 95 years, which is still a pretty long time. That's why happy birthday is still protected by copyright. That's why you got all those goofy, happy, happy, joy, joy songs that they sing <laughs> in the restaurants now. <laughs> because all of a sudden they started enforcing the happy birthday. Uh, uh, copyrights and so right. 95 years 100 years that's a long time and so you know when it's longer than that uh, coming up to 170 160 150 years that's a little long I agree with you a little as you mentioned just a little long a little long in the tooth what do you think uh, <laughs> Professor Mulrain uh, we're talking yeah. about copyright terms Right, and I, I missed most of that, but I think I caught the, the gist at the end there. Um, I, I do think that life plus 70 is a little long. Um, life plus, plus 50 really felt a little bit better to me than life plus 70. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree that, that um, there's probably not going to be much support for that being extended beyond what it is now. I would, I would agree with that. Okay, well, one thing we do have uh, as a fail-safe is the fair use doctrine. Um, and we have a story that involves uh, some rappers and some criticism. And I'll try and walk you through it. Uh, there's a hip-hop artist named Lord Finesse. He's suing someone named Mac Miller for $10 million uh, over some sampling in one of Miller's uh, works. Though Eric Gardner over at The Hollywood Reporter Esquire uh, says that a substantial part of the musical track to which Finesse lays claim is actually from jazz musician Os Oscar Peterson's 1971 recording Dream of You. So there's not, it's not quite clear, you know, how strong this case is on the merits. But either way, uh, a rapper named Dan Bull got upset that Lord Finesse had brought this lawsuit and made a video uh, criticizing Finesse and the lawsuit. Um, and I assume in this video, I'm not familiar enough with the music to be able to, to say what the background music is. We can play a bit of it for you in a second. Um, I assume he sampled some of Lord Finesse's music in this criticizing video, which um, if, if we've got that queued up, we'll play some for you. So you can see what this is all about. Nice track. Who is it? Mac Miller. I thought it was Lord Finesse. Or was it Oscar Peterson? Sounds like 
Summit by Dan Bull. Dear Lord Finesse, I caught you in the middle of an awful mess. So forlorn regrets if my recordings are causing more duress. But the stress upon my chest needs sorting, yes. You chopped a beat from Oscar Peterson's release and it's an easy Mac repeated it. Now he's a thief for re-releasing it. Please, he just retweeted it and lyrically retweeted it. We heated up a piece of it for each of us to eat a bit. But Funky G doesn't believe the shit. Hypocrisy. I like that. I think we should just stop the show and play that the rest of the time. <laughs> Obviously, he is... Um, Taking some shots at Lord Finesse there about uh, about taking shots at people who lyrically retweet his work. Um, and the reason we're able to play that for you, Lord Finesse actually DMCA'd the video on YouTube. So the original copy of it was pulled down. Uh, but then dozens of YouTubers in protest have re-uploaded it. So it's there, available to view, just not um, from the person who originally uploaded it. Others on the web are urging Dan Bull to counter notice this and fight back because clearly he's engaged in commentary and criticism here and he's got a pretty good fair use argument, I would say. Uh, but Bull says he's scared. He, uh, he sees that Finesse is already suing someone for $10 million. He doesn't want to be on the wrong end of that. Um, so as far as we know, he's not going to fight the... Um, the takedown. And actually, you know, with dozens of other people uploading it, people seem to be able to see his work. So there's not much point in him fighting it. Um, so let's see, Ramona, you have uh, litigated a lot of sampling cases. Why don't you give us your take on all this? Um, I actually agree with you in your comment uh, with respect to, I don't know why he would be afraid to do that. It seems to me that it's uh, fair use. He's making a comment on mm -hmm. some pending litigation. And, you know, it, it actually all works out f for Dan Bull as it is, uh, not so much maybe for Miller, who's being sued. Um, you know, because Lord Finesse has to prove that the work was original to him. And if he's copied Oscar Peterson, then I'm not sure how he can prevail on his infringement claim in the first instance. I, it wasn't clear to me if this was governed by law in the UK or the US in the, in the first place, but the, inter, the internet aspect to it, I, I also had the same thought. Why didn't he just counter notice this and say it's not infringement because they have to allege in the first place that there's a good faith belief that an infringement has occurred. Um, He's got his message out there. I also, I just thought it was a commentary and that it mm -hmm. could be considered fair use, even if he's incorporating the Lord Finesse song and doing some comparison of the two himself. He, it, that sounds to me uh, like exactly what fair use was intended to protect, that that wouldn't constitute an infringement. However, he's drawing attention to himself and, and the... It's getting out there anyway, uploaded by other folks, as, they, as you mentioned. Yeah. So I think he's made, he's made his point. I don't think he's trying to make any money, but he's made his point. Yeah, Evan, do, are you concerned that somebody who seems to be, you know, at first blush on the right side of a legal argument would be chilled just by the system and, and the fact that, you know, I don't want to get involved in, in a legal dispute? Well, yeah, that that's the the big thing here. I mean, this is a special circumstance with with Dan Bull here because for whatever reason the circumstances have made it that we all have paid attention to this and we're talking about it and he doesn't need to do anything further uh to 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 raise awareness of this issue that the job that he set out to do has has been accomplished. So the the concern would come from uh more heavy-handed uh, rights holders in situations where the the speech is quelched right away and there's no opportunity for others to pick up on it. Because uh, I think we've talked about Dan Bull before in episodes past. I mean, this is all ringing a bell. I didn't go back and look at the, some show archives, but I think he's come across our desks before mm -hmm. in, in issues like this. So he already has a built-in reputation and already has a, a following and there there's a certain cred that he carries with him already. Um, the, the, the fear and the real risk of being chilled is much more present in those people who uh, would speak with a quiet or smaller voice in, in all of this. And that's... Um, that, that's a concern that we would want to have. All right. Well, we were talking a moment ago about the length of copyright terms. Uh, in 1888, Friedrich Nietzsche 
uh, wrote the phrase that we are all familiar with, that which does not kill us make a, makes us stronger. Um, so I'm not quite sure, you know, what, what Nietzsche's copyright status would be, depending on uh, Life Plus 70 of any of his co-authors. <laughs> but um, he is not contending any, any right in that phrase, as far as I know. Uh, but someone went after Kanye West for his stronger tune, and Kanye emerged victorious in the Seventh Circuit in your neck of the woods, Evan. Um, Vincent Peters... Uh, is who sued him, claiming that he, uh, this again comes to us from Eric Gardner. Hello, Eric. Uh, he sent um, one of Kanye's friends a copy of a song uh, that was also called Stronger. And uh, by osmosis, perhaps Kanye must have picked it up. But uh, Kanye introduced Nietzsche at trial. Uh, didn't actually put him on the stand, as far as I know, uh, but pointed out that this phrase is uh, a part of our culture. And uh, actually, Kelly Clarkson, with her uh, uh, stronger song, too, um, also was supportive of his arguments and persuasive on the judge. And uh, so Kanye emerged victorious. Uh, Evan, this is both uh, a court in your jurisdiction and uh, a philosopher in your wheelhouse. So fire away. Right. Well, I, you know, actually, I don't want to say a whole lot about this because I knew the parties representing the plaintiff and all this. So I don't really want to say the wrong thing or, you know, too much, too much about this just because uh, mm -hmm. Nietzsche died in 1900. So uh, the, his works should be in the public domain, I think, under any kind of calculus, uh, you know, notwithstanding the fact that his works were first published uh, in Europe, which would, which would complicate it as well. So, yeah, that's really all I have to, to, to say about this um, other than and uh, you know that it's it presents presented some interesting uh, interesting issues on all this. So if I can kind of deflect it off of me to for for others more apt to to talk about the the merits of the copyright situation. Sure, uh, Ramona, were you surprised at the outcome here at all, or did you think this was uh, properly resolved? Well, actually, reading the news article, it seemed like the appropriate outcome until I read the case. And I went, actually mm -hmm. went and pulled the case and read the lyrics of the song, and I see why the action was filed. It wasn't just a matter of that phrase, mm -hmm. uh, because some of the lines in the song were very similar. You know, mm -hmm. the reference to Kate Moss, the model. Uh, you know, there's a lot of models in the world, and why would they just happen to p both pick Kate Moss to talk about? They both use the what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I like the word, uh, the more I blow up, the more you wronger. <laughs> I like that English. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, Kanye West had, because I, I can't get much wronger. And so they use the same kind of word. I don't know if that's a common word. I hadn't heard that before. Uh, but some of these lines are very similar in, in the chorus of the song, which is, of course, you look at what, it's not so much what's in the, you know, in allegedly infringing song, but the, uh, uh, the song that has been infringed, and you look at what is important to that song, you know, what's the, uh, the heart of that song, and what has that been taken, and you usually look to the hook and the chorus. Well, he took the hook, and the choruses in the song are very similar um, I don't think it's a coincidence. I think he must, it seems to me he heard the song, whether by osmosis or any other way, because mm. there's so many lines that are very similar. It's in the appendix to the, uh, to, the case, to the case where the judge recited it. Now, for the reasons that the judge gave, picking out those things, the legal outcome seemed correct. I didn't see any reference to a musicology report. I didn't see what, you know, the discussion of prior art you know, musically, if the songs were the same, uh, I didn't hear any of that discussion. But if he sued on the basis of it just being that, you know, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger, then I would agree with the decision. Uh, I, I, there was a little bit more that I, I didn't get in terms of the evidence about the musicological report. You know, there's other songs that are out there. I think that's in the Bible, you know. Mandisa has a song called Stronger, the same type of thing. Right. But you I, can, it, that's an idea that you can write on. These songs happen to have a lot of very closely or very similar lines to it. Apparently the judge wasn't convinced of it, though. Uh, what do you think, Lauren? Uh, this case seems like uh, the Nietzsche defense may uh, 
may be something that is now an established part of jurisprudence. Right. You know, <laughs> I, I, I did not pull the case. Um, so I, I'll defer to Ramona's um, evaluation of what she saw in the actual case. But what I saw in the article, it did sound like the right decision was made um, in that what we have is very common phrases, very common terms that are used um, sort of in a pedestrian way in, in slang and ordinary language. And essentially what you have is ideas that can be used by other people. So um, certainly didn't seem like there was uh, a, a cause of action that, that uh, was viable from the article. Um, but I, I will, I, like I said, I will defer to Ramona saying that in the actual case, there were some other elements that um, appeared that might have been problematic. All right. Well, Evan, we're going to talk now. What, what was your uh, Twitter hashtag for things that are first world problems? Uh, it was B, uh, F W P O T Y 12 first world problems of the year for 2012. It was, I was talking about Rick Clow being upset about, uh, you know, printers that won't automatically upgrade their firmware. It's like, oh man, that's awful, isn't it? So yeah, things along that, uh, things along that line are just awful, <laughs> awful stuff. Well, I don't know if this necessarily falls into that category, but it might, um, Axl Rose, sued um, the makers of Guitar Hero, claiming that he had some understandings with them, some contracts with them to uh, keep Slash out of Guitar Hero 3 if um, the Guns N' Roses music was going to be used in that game. Uh, Slash is front and center, as you can see if you're watching the video, uh, on the packaging and uh, Axel wasn't happy about this, but then Axel went back and forth on it for over three years. And, you know, he claimed uh, that he was fraudulently induced into entering into the contract, licensing the music on the premise that, that Slash wouldn't be in there. Slash is there. And uh, he also then claimed during the ensuing three years that they were attempting to dangle some other uh, enticements in front of him for what he would get. Uh, out of the game or different video game benefits he would receive. Um, so he didn't wind up suing on that for more than three years. And uh, he's SOL, which does not mean necessarily what you think it means <laughs> in the law. It means a statute of limitations on that claim. But he still has a contract claim going. Um, so what do you think, Evan? First world, first world problem? Uh, probably. And it also shows a big shift in Axel's approach to the world. You know, if you go back to 1986 or 87's Appetite for Destruction, you know, one of the good tracks on that was Mr. Brownstone and Axel saying, I don't worry about nothing, no, because worrying's a waste of my time. Obviously, he has changed his tune on that. I mean, good grief, Axel. You're worried about the fact that you appeared in connection with Slash? I mean, uh, you know, I was... Uh, Pretty big Guns N' Roses fans back <laughs> band back in the late eighties and early nineties and and stuff and, and and the idea of linking Axel and Slash together is, I mean, those two concepts are completely inseparable. There's no way you can think of Axel without. It's like thinking of Laurel without Hardy or, um, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how you can think of think of two things that are. It's hard to think of examples on the fly like that. I can't believe Laurel and Hardy. What does that say about me? Um, so. <laughs> You Lennon know, and McCartney. <laughs> Lennon and McCartney. Jack, yeah. Keith Richards. Yeah, Simon and Garfunkel. Um, right, uh, right. Th Tom and Katie. Um, you know, so <laughs> it, it, it's 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 really hard to uh, to to see what the real issue is here, other than some kind of uh, uh, perspective that Axel is taking on this that really is so much based on his own personal interests and, and you know, dare I say, an overactive uh, ego. Uh, on all of this. So I would, uh, you know, hate to see the law come in and support him in that, especially given these other facts, you know, his fraudulent concealment defense, the statute of limitations failed, you know, because he waited three years to file a lawsuit. You know, if you're really upset about something, you don't wait for three years to file a lawsuit, no matter what kind of representations you're getting from the other side that would make you delay. So, uh, yes, this is a, a good example of a uh, of a first world problem that uh, we're we're better off letting our court systems handle handle other things. I think. Yes, absolutely. It's a ludicrous maybe concept what we'll... that that he would wait three years because yeah. we were promised I would get another deal worth millions of dollars. That just sounds outrageous. Yes, it does. 
But I'm, I'm just wondering now if, you know, this sets a precedent on his contract case. If um, if Tom will keep Katie off the video game version of Mission, Mission Impossible or have some success in doing that. Um, I, I think it's an Only interesting. Yes. It's an interesting thing to consider, you know, that musicians now have such first world problems to deal with. You know, the packaging on the video game that's made from their famous album a few decades ago uh, was probably not foremost in their mind when uh, when right you know doing all the licensing and contracts around that album. Uh, Ramona, do you agree? Uh, yes, I do. And I, I was thinking about why would he come up with this? Even if he's represented by counsel, you know, he could claim that he was lulled into this false sense of security about what they were going to do about it, but. He was represented by counsel. You know, he should have had his own tolling agreement on that anyway. Um, and I'm not sure. Yeah. Just, you're right. This, please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's a legal response. Please. Right. Really <laughs> <legal. laughs> Sorry. Axel, please. <gasps> It reminds right. me in law school, a legal writing class I uh, had where the professor said that, you know, the shortest response brief in the history of all legal writing was six word is like plaintiff has got to be kidding. <laughs> 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 yes, that is awesome. All right. Well, we do have uh, one other sort of copyright related story that was found by our intern, Franklin, uh, that I want to talk about uh, something new from the founders of YouTube that's called Zine. But before we get to that, I want to thank our sponsor for this episode of This Week in Law, and that is ShareFile. You know, in business, we're constantly collaborating with colleagues and clients, sharing files like contracts, spreadsheets, presentations, arguing over whether Slash can be on the packaging or not. And it's essential that these important files are kept safe, secure, and under your control. That's why I recommend ShareFile by Citrix. It's easy to use, and it's a business solution that allows you to exchange files quickly and securely. So when you've got your Guitar Hero claim that you're prepping and you have all the music and the game experience that you need to share back and forth, and of course, the, all of the graphics uh, and the videos of the gameplay, that all gets really big and really hard to transfer around on the net. But if you're using ShareFile, you can send and receive those files with anybody you like. Uh, Activision's counsel won't see it at all because they're not authorized to be able to look at how you're uh, conversing with your counsel. Uh, you can collaborate, you can share, and it doesn't matter the size of the file because the way this works is instead of sending the file as an attachment, uh, it just basically hosts and creates a link to the file, uh, but then has enough technology around all that that the only people who are going to be able to access are who you authorize. Uh, there's not going to be any lingering around of that product on the web if you don't want it there. Uh, you control who has access, the levels of permission they have. It syncs automatically, so you and your team will always have the most updated materials. And you can access ShareFile from anywhere, your laptop, your tablet, your smartphone. You can work on the go with this app. And of course, that's what we all do these days. So I want you to try ShareFile with my special offer. You sign up today and you'll get a 30-day free trial. To do that, go to ShareFile.com, click on the radio microphone and enter the promo code TWIL, T-W-I-L, Remember, visit sharefile.com and type in the promo code TWIL. All right, so Franklin put this uh, under our noses. It is called Zine at zine.com. It's from uh, Chad Hurley and the folks now at Avos. Of course, he founded YouTube uh, and Avos now owns Delicious. So what Zine does is it's sort of a clipping service that allows you to create your own digital magazine. Um, and I can see where this would be nice to have on the web, even nicer to have in a mobile environment. It's sort of a flipboard without pulling in content from established sources. Uh, it's a twist that lets uh, people aggregate what they want into their own zines and then you know, publish those and enable people to uh, consume them. So I really see this as kind of a mobile play. Um, it has 
a layer of copy protection that uh, Flipboard didn't have. We've talked about Flipboard and Pinterest and other sites on the show that allow you to aggregate things from the web. Um, here, the the aggregation is happening not uh, on the side of the business, but on the side of its users. So uh, maybe Chad Hurley learned his lesson from YouTube and uh, is deciding, well, hey, the DMCA is his friend. And if people are going to aggregate things that uh, are infringing, then... And, and of course, you know, as with Pinterest, if you're out there on the web, just about everything out there is going to be copyright in one way or another. Uh, I, I think that uh, Zine is being careful to to put the infringement liability off on its users. When you read its copyright policy, uh, it tells users in no uncertain terms, you know, don't infringe. We're not responsible for your infringement, et cetera. So I don't know, Evan, again, we've got sort of a business model that's telling users not to infringe, but... Uh, the way this works, I, I, you'd be hard pressed not to, I think. So, so what do you think about Zine? Well, you know, curation is one of those words that, when we say it on the show, confetti is supposed to fall from the skies, and mm. uh, you know, we take a drink. So, this is another animal in the curation menagerie. You know, we've got, um, you know, things like Pinterest, of course. You've got uh, things like Tumblr and, you know, the the ease with which you can kind of customize content and put it in a little package for yourself. And, uh, you know, when we were talking about Pinterest uh, a few months ago, I was like, oh, you know, this is really just like GeoCities. And as much as all it is, is a platform for you to gather content and put it up into one place. So, um, you know, clearly it is different as you're talking about here. It, it does <clears throat> differentiate itself from Flipboard uh, or Pulse, you know, in as much as there's, it's not the service itself that's compiling and curating this stuff, but it's the user. So yes, the DMCA protections and the safe harbor are more uh, clearly invoked in all of that stuff. So so I like it. It's clever. It uh, looks like it could be handy. It looks like something that could be really handy for us, uh, pr- uh, you know, preparing for the show each week. You know, now mm-hmm. we have a couple of different ways of putting together the content that we want to talk about, whether it be a stream of, of tagged content using Delicious or you know, in the Google spreadsheet, this is would be a nice, very aesthetically pleasing way to to uh, you know access and consume the content that's uh, been brought together for a single purpose like this. So, uh, pretty neat, and you know, it seems like it puts the uh, rights and obligations and protections of the DMCA safe harbors uh, front and center on on its architecture. Right. Lauren, is this another example of technology doing something that is harming? content producers uh, simply because it can and it looks pretty? Well, you know, it sounds to me like they're really trying to do the right thing with regard to um, getting the protections in place up front. And that's something that doesn't always happen. You know, folks ask for forgiveness rather than permission, usually. So um, I I like that idea. Um, From what I know, uh, it sounds like they're doing the right thing. They've got good counsel setting it up. Um, I guess one question that'll come as this develops is what the use is or what the, you know, the, the predominant uses are of, of, of the, uh, you know, for the end user. If it's a commercial use, that opens up a whole nother chapter that's, that's not contemplated here. But so far, so good. Yeah, I, I, you're right. They're not making it available for commercial use now, but, but right. I definitely... It certainly seems like a, a likely <laughs> future path for mm-hmm. the company. Um, any thoughts, Ramona? Yeah, I was just trying to figure out what the end use was going to be when I was reviewing mm-hmm. it. And e- even though, um, you know, photographers don't, are some of the people whose copyrights are violated the worst, that they hardly see any money anyway as it is. But then to have it in this kind of setting, I don't know how the rights are being cleared and then ultimately what it's going to be used for other than, you know, you're going to send something to your mom or your family or I don't know what the ultimate use is going to be. And I didn't get enough information out of the article to figure that out. But even if um, uh, Zine shifts, you know, through the DMCA, the responsibility, you know, it's not residing with them and they've, they've got that protection uh, the question becomes then, if they know the end users are infringing, are they mm-hmm. really protected by that? Uh, mm-hmm. Are they inducing or encouraging infringement? Right. Uh, and so I guess what would have to see how this ultimately plays out and what it's going to be used for. Uh, and, I, you know, you don't need a commercial purpose to infringe. And so, 
um, I, I just had, would have to see it in action to see in action to see um, what the potential responsibility could be for the end user, and then if there's any kind of secondary liability, even with the DMCA in place. Yeah, this is one I, we're not quite sure um, how it works technically. If it's side loading, we're not quite sure. You know what their end game is business wise. But I think it's an interesting one to watch, Evan. I think you know one thing that could be said about it is maybe it's just um, a browser. Maybe, maybe it should be looked at that way. Do you think that that is a viable argument? Well, yeah. I mean, in as much as. Uh, it would not cache uh, content on its own, and I'm, I was, mm-hmm. you know, inspecting some of the elements and uh, fr- on on you know some of these zines here, and it looks like they it does cache the content in much the same way that uh, Pinterest does. So mm-hmm. that would appear to take away a little bit from the argument that it's merely a browser, because not only is it serving up. Uh, content, but it is uh, hosting it its, itself. Um, mm-hmm. Most of the uh, images uh, appear to be stored at a domain called imgix.net. Now, I haven't, you know, done any gumshoe trailing to figure out what that is, but that's, it's all, they're all in one place, you know, where, where all the content appears to be stored. So it doesn't seem to be where, you know, it all, it all is uh, originating. It's not just like hot linking or, uh, you know, framing or whatever other terminology you want to use for um, a more browser-like uh, platform would, would be. Right. So. Okay, well, let's move on over to the arena of patents. Because, of course, we had closing arguments in the Apple versus Samsung trial this week. And I realize that our panel may not have been slavishly following this trial. I won't pretend to have been slavishly following this trial, uh, but it is an item of interest uh, out there. And and they did wrap. We don't have a jury verdict yet. Uh, we had Apple talking a lot about how Samsung's products looked just like theirs, worked just like theirs, had icons just like theirs. Samsung uh, played the innovation card, I think, a lot in uh, in closing argument. Um, of course, they have their own infringement claims too. And the other uh, interesting gloss on all this, they're not just suing each other in the U.S., uh, but in several countries. And in Korea, just this week, uh, there was a verdict that both companies were infringing each other's patents. So I don't know if that's any indication of what we might see here. There's a 22-page long, very detailed special verdict form that the jury is going to be asked to parse and is parsing as we speak uh, to decide Decide who infringed what, um, and so what I want to ask our professors today is is just I I know this probably as, as I'm assuming is not something you've been paying too close attention to, but since the um, entertainment industry now relies so much on these kinds of platforms, smartphones and tablets to distribute their works. I'm wondering if you feel like there's a horse in this race at all, you know, whether Apple emerges triumphant or whether Samsung does. What do you think, Professor Mulrain? I don't think it really matters from the standpoint of the artistic world because what we have really is the two dominant smartphone um, forces, the, the, the iPhone versus the Droid, and both of them have been uh, very responsive in offering apps and, and opportunities for the artistic and creative community to, um, to utilize their, their platforms. So I don't think there's really a horse in the race per se as far as that goes. And I, and I did think, I, I saw that ruling in Korea yesterday, and I thought that was interesting and, and wondered myself, just like you did, whether or not that was a you know, a foreshadowing of what might happen here. All right. What do you think, Ramona? You know, th- my response was going to be just what Dr. Moraine just said. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that it really matters. I mean, obviously the decision matters on whether it constitutes an infringement or one's going to cancel the other one out if they're both infringing. But as far as the music industry is concerned, that's just another method of delivering that music. So, you know, I don't know that that's going to affect anything in the music industry. Um, I, no, I just don't see it right now. I don't know. I mean, the reason the reason I raised the question is because Apple. I'm wondering if maybe having Apple have more competition uh, makes a difference to the music industry, since Apple has been so pivotal in bringing music 
into a saleable digital format and is it's not the only game in town anymore but but it's a big game so i just wondered if if that at all had crossed well, your mind. Apple- oh i'm sorry I'm I was just going to say, Apple makes its deal with the major labels and not with the music publishers because mm-hmm. of the pass-through provisions. You know, you don't have the, the, the other big players in the music industry, which are the music publishers owning the musical compositions, who have nothing really to say about the masters that get licensed for purposes of using that through iTunes because if it gets licensed through whatever deal Apple has made with the different major labels, the publisher gets their, their money through the labels, which is a not a good position that the publishers want to be in, but that's the way the pass-through provision was created back in 1995. So um, that's just what I want to say about it is you don't really have the input from all of the industry because uh, iTunes has got ahead, got started early and made a pretty sweet deal with all the major labels to do that. Right. So and Professor Maureen. That we, yeah, one of the articles that we read this week um, on these issues, I can't remember which article it was, but one of the the takeaways from it was that at the end of the day, the consumer really just wants something that works. And iTunes works Mm -hmm. and works well. And that's why, you know, the the Walmart 88 cent download thing didn't take off. And the iPod works and works really well. And that's why the Zoom didn't take off. You know, when, when things come into the marketplace and really do a good job, the consumer doesn't necessarily care about there being four or five different options if they know that the one they have is, is going to do the job. So, um, so that, I think that's, that's a, a piece of the, you know, the angle from the other side of the table. Right. As far as being a good alternative that works, I'm sure Google wants to be that with its play music offering and Amazon wants to be that too. And that they'd certainly have more, of a chance uh, on a non-iPhone platform to pull that off, although, of course, they want to pull it off on all platforms they can. Uh, Evan, any thoughts? Um, Just that the outcome of the uh, Samsung and Apple litigation would only affect the uh, mar- the creative marketplace, for lack of a better term, to talk about this, trying to couch it in the in the terms that we're using here, I- indirectly at best. I think of these of the the war going on with the patents when it, when it, and the design patents when it comes to Samsung and Apple, very much akin to the protectability of the user interface, like the Windows user user interface that you know we we settled all the way back in the '80s. And so, um, in as much as those issues are going to be resolved in this litigation, that will affect the whole marketplace and the the economics of it all affecting the the prices that consumer pay consumers pay for these things and that will in turn uh, affect the uh, the the adoption the continued uh, acceleration or leveling off of, of the adoption of these technologies. And the more people that are using mobile technology, the more content is shared, the more uh, opportunities there are for the use and the exploitation of, of the stuff that we use, that we uh, consume and, and distribute and share using the, uh, the mobile um, universe, you know, the, the mobile, uh, the way of, of um, uh, experiencing the internet and sharing content with each other. So there's certainly no direct relationship to kind of the copyright and entertainment law issues, but uh, it's not too hard to draw some steps, trace some steps from uh, one arena affecting another. Ramona, one of our IRC chatters raises a great point I want to toss in front of you. And that is that in, on the iOS side uh, and in iTunes, Uh, Apple has rolled out iTunes Match, which basically kind of sort of almost legalizes pirated music by looking at the music on your computer, no matter how it got there, and then allowing you to access that music in the cloud. Um, Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I'm not... I'm not even familiar with that. That doesn't even sound... I haven't even heard that before, just the words coming out of your mouth. So I'm not sure uh, how iTunes could do that under the license that they have from any of the major labels. I'm not, yeah, I, I don't, I don't understand. They came out with it last, sep- they came out with it last September. It's a paid service. It's about uh, $25 a year. And uh, it, it they oh, I'm have, sorry. I thought it, you were just saying it was free and it was just out there. That, no, no, okay. no, no. It's a paid service and they did get okay. authorized to do it. I mean, they're not just sort of, flying out there and doing it. They are, they are, uh, you know, 
paying the industry money for the privilege of doing that. But it is sort of like a um, a largesse to people who have downloaded in the past, you know, maybe before they were using iTunes, um, that allows them to kind of legalize that music. Um, So... If you haven't looked at it too now, closely, now mm-hmm. having, I, yeah, yeah, I haven't actually looked at it, but now, yeah. now that you say that, that would make, it, that makes sense to me. And I, I, you know, in terms of making that music available, if it's done by agreement, then they're, you know, who am I to say that it's incorrect? I, uh, that's fine if it, if it's accepted and it's licensed and it's part of the deal that you can get. But I, I just thought it was interesting what Lauren had said though, in terms of, uh, you know, iTunes works and everybody seems to think it's okay, and that is true. But mm-hmm. the irony to me is that's a monopoly. And how many years have we fought like with um, Ma Bell to break up the monopoly so our phone lines could be as cheap as they are now? And we've got virtually a monopoly on a service. And nobody's even questioning that. You know, other people have really tried to break into that. You know, all of the major labels tried to do it, tried to have their own music services. And none of them have really succeeded where iTunes has, and they're doing it at extremely profitable. Well, Apple is profitable. I don't know that iTunes, to hear Steve Jobs tell it, iTunes isn't profitable, that they were barely making it because of the exorbitant costs that were charged by um the recording industry for their music, but the uh, I think the uh, iTunes being the monopoly that it is, it would seem that consumers would want more choices where that could affect the price or the availability of the music. But it is a fact that iTunes has just made it easy, even when they jumped the price for people who had already downloaded the music and it went from ninety nine cents to a dollar twenty nine the next time you wanted to put it on another device. Uh, mm-hmm. And people still stuck with it. They were mad for a few days and they got over it. You know, it's another 30 cents. They got over it. And now they've just moved on and downloaded the music again. Right. I, I, think I think it's really it's interesting that, that that's your perspective. Because I, I, from my side, I see a lot more competition with iTunes these days, both from Amazon and Google and things like Spotify and Pandora that don't do exactly the same thing, but, right. you know, are a way that people consume music that, leave iTunes completely uh, out of the picture. Lauren, you were going to say? Yeah, I was going to say those those examples you gave um, mm-hmm. still fit within what I was going to say, which is the reason why the record labels did not succeed with their own stores is because they didn't offer everything. You know, mm-hmm. if you go to a clothing store, you want to buy a suit, a shirt, tie, and shoes at the same place. You don't want to have to buy your pants one place and your jacket at the next door and then the belt at the next door. And that's what would happen if if Sony only sold Sony and if Warner only sold Warner, you know. So having everything accessible, which is what iTunes does, and as as you just indicated, what a Spotify or, or, you know, these other services would do uh, is really what the consumer wants. The consumer doesn't want to have to knock on a bunch of doors to get all the music they want. Right. All right. Well, you mentioned Ma Bell a second ago, Ramona. Uh, I think our last story of the day here will look at uh, a net neutrality question. Uh, AT&T has come up a couple of times in this context. This time, uh, what they've done is to offer users the ability to use FaceTime uh, on Apple's iOS platform uh, on the 3G cellular system as opposed to just Wi-Fi. But in doing that, they're only going to offer it to customers who have opted into a particular data plan. Um, And presumably that data plan, I, I, for example, have, you know, one of the original, because I bought one of the original iPhones, I have the original unlimited data plan. I'm not going to be able to use that And, you know, it really kind of bums me out. You have to subscribe to the mobile share data plan. In my particular situation, I would love for my son to be able to FaceTime me because he has a device that can do that that's not a phone. But in order for him to do that, uh, you know, he has to be on Wi-Fi. That's a little bit easier. He's likely to be in a place where there is Wi-Fi. But if I'm out and about in the world, I'm not. So he tries to reach me. And unless I jump on this plan, I'm out of luck. So... Um, some people would just say that's the breaks, competition, pay up, and you can use that service. Uh, others, including public knowledge and our friend John Bergmeier over there who's been on the show, uh, think that this is running afoul of 
um, the FCC's net neutrality rules, that there's no networked based reason for this, no infrastructure reason, that it's simply a way of AT&T discriminating among traffic. Uh, so far, the FCC hasn't chimed in on this at all. Evan, what do you think they'll say? Well, there's a couple of uh, several different issues that are that are really interesting in all of this, and I think the the overarching one, most general and most informative one, is look at how uh, marketplace uh, forces and discussion in the marketplace is has the potential to affect what AT&T does here in the absence of uh, assuming that there were no network neutrality principles and rules that that may bind it in all of this. I mean, this is causing outrage. And I would like to think the most optimistic part of my soul would like to think that once AT&T makes more investments in its infrastructure and can actually deliver a service unobstructed uh, whereas now it feels like the, uh, the the generous use of FaceTime would cause network congestion and, and you know cause some serious problems. Uh, because of that, it has has implemented this um, this this restriction. Uh, I would like to think that that the technological reality would would solve this particular problem uh, without having to to resort to looking at network neutrality principles because of the marketplace influences and the marketplace conversations. I guess another thing is that, um, you know, AT&T seems to be doing something a little bit disingenuous on this, and that is uh, employing some strange semantics. Actually, I don't know how they're doing it, making this argument that the uh, FCC rules would not uh, be uh, would not prohibit them from um, uh, putting restrictions and putting conditions on the use of a pre-installed app uh, because their argument is that the network neutrality rules implemented by the FCC would only prohibit uh, restrictions on the use of downloaded apps. I mean, that's a strange difference uh, that doesn't seem to, it's a distinction that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of practical difference, but it seems to be, you know, arguing uh, you know, making some kind of disingenuous argument around uh, to to justify their decision to do this for network uh, management reasons. The third point is, isn't it difficult to really prove up what it means for AT and T to be doing this for legitimate network management reasons, which the uh, which the FCC net neutrality rules would prohibit or would permit them uh, to do? So if there was anything that the FCC was going to do on that, it seems like the inquiry would be there, uh, you know, in examining whether or not AT&T's decision to do this is something that's legitimate and that it actually uh, can do, uh, notwithstanding these no blocking provisions in the, in the relevant uh, FCC rules. So several different, uh, several dis- different uh, interesting ways to, to skin this cat. Yeah, all really good points. And I also think it's interesting that in their public statements, AT&T has come out and said, well, it's okay because our users can still use this on Wi-Fi, you know, which absolutely has nothing to do with the net neutrality issue because they (laughs) can't use it on 3G so or 4G or whatever they may have have be offering these days. So my question to our entertainment law professors. <laughs> I realize this is a bit out in the weeds, but but is it really? Because part of the reason that net neutrality is an issue is, you know, as bandwidth gets better, but spectrum is more limited and media gets more rich and so much more is distributed via the internet, I, net neutrality becomes uh, a, quite an important point for the entertainment industry, I would think, you know, who frequently has made a lot of its revenue by partnering with distribution channels. It's just that the distribution channels may now be shifting to ISPs as opposed to cable or movie houses or what the traditional outlets have been. So I'm wondering, Lauren, uh, if you feel like, again, your industry has a a dog or a a dog in this hunt. I said horse in this race before. (laughs) Um, I think the, the, at the end of the day, the more platforms that are available with the least barriers to entrance um, are going to be preferred by those who are trying to exploit their intellectual property. As long as the exploitation can be monitored and can be monetized, 
then ultimately you just want to make sure that you have as many opportunities with as few barriers. And, and that's, you know, the net neutrality does come into play with that because as, as, as you so articulately indicated with your situation with your son, you know, AT&T's response is, is, is irrelevant with regard to you having a device and your son having a different type of device that does not connect in the same manner unless you're both on, wife, on, uh, on the uh, system. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, definitely from the standpoint of down the road, it does make a difference to us because we would like to have, um, you know, those barriers broken down. Right. In, in one of the articles, you, either the Nick Bilton or David Pogue one that we were talking about earlier, Holmes Wilson was quoted and he is someone who is an activist um, against legislation that would uh, impact the function of the Internet. Um, he said that when you have a fair price and easy access, you have less infringement. But because of the monopoly power of cable companies and content creators, they might actually wind up making less money right. in that situation. Uh, Ramona, do you think that that comes into play here at all when we talk about these net neutrality issues? Um, yeah, I, the only reason I'm hesitating here because there's always this big conflict between the uh, the technology side and the the content owners. You know, the content owners. As Lauren said, we want our stuff out there, but the question is: Is, is there going to be? Is it? Is there any money connected with it? Uh, you know, how how are we going to make money, and what's the incentive to continue to create uh, in light of technology that's putting it out there in so many different ways? Um, you know, the, the I think I'm going back to your question: Was do you have a dog in the hunt or a horse in the race? <laughs> or a fish in the water? Maybe a dog that's racing or a horse that's hunting. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I haven't paid that close of it. Isn't that terrible to say? Uh, close attention to the net neutrality issue, other than the thought of the government intervening in in the control of the internet, scares me to death. Because I don't think there should be any control on the internet. The internet works in the free marketplace, uh, but I guess if you have to have access to bandwidth, you know, you're going to have some uh, control on the government there through the FCC. What you don't want to have the control over is what that content is, and does everybody have access to it? Uh, I was the Evan was talking about something, and it brought up another question. It was not just a technological question from AT and T, and then I, I was thinking about the economic issue from AT and T standpoint as well about making this all available to everybody. You know, the three G or the Wi Fi connection that you were referring to. Uh, the cost for them for doing that wouldn't they necessarily well, I'm not an advocate for AT&T by any means, but because I've just had my plans change, and if you change anything, then they upgrade it, and it always costs you more, and you can't go back to the old plan no matter what you do. Um, is there a, you know, can they still do it in terms of an economic reason for uh, limiting your access to something? Aside from the technology being available, isn't there an economic consideration that goes with that as well? And the economic consideration, not only for making that technology available, but then the cost of the content that is made uh, distributed through the technology. And that, that's a question I have back to you. And I'm sorry, it's not really an answer to your question, but it was just more, I was concerned about those plans because I deal with AT&T myself. And right. uh, why wouldn't an economic reason uh, I mean, it seems like AT&T could have an economic justification even if the technology was available for switching you off into a different plan or causing you to pay more for a data plan. Uh, you know, because we've gone from these unlimited data plans to now you have to pay for so much data uh, mm -hmm. before you're cut off. Uh, not slow down, but just cut off. Or you have to actually not even cut off. You actually have to just pay more. You know, you roll over automatically. At least now we get a signal that says you're ex almost exceeding the limit of your data plan either stop or you're going to get charged again. So I think I turn that question back to you. Um, I'm sorry. And it was just one that I had myself as I was listening to you talk about those issues. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to leave it to the FCC to parse all of this because we're getting close <laughs> to the end of our show. Oh, uh, and I'm going, to go, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give folks our MCLE pass raise, our first one for the show. A little late in the show to do it, but uh, at least I remembered to do it. That's going to be horses, dogs, and fish. 
<laughs> so uh, if you're listening to this uh, show for MCLE credit, and I'm happy to report that we've gotten our first um, approval from the state of California for one of our shows, that's going to be episode 166. And we'll get more information up about that shortly. Uh, but that one has been affirmatively approved by the state of California for MCLE. So that's our first, yay, thumbs up for MCLE. Um, and part of what we have to do for that is verify uh, that people have listened. So before you get your form, we have these pass phrases in the show that's the first one for this show, Horses, Dogs, and Fish. And uh, with that, we'll go on and do our tip of the week, uh, which is pretty funny. It came from Mike Elgin over on Google+. Plus. There was an employer, and he actually posted this over to Reddit because I think he thought it was so funny, uh, who posted a, a camera in the office to monitor the employee's activity put it up, it looks like it kind of on a door frame. So it was supposed to be up monitoring the employees. And uh, so this is our tip. What to do if your employer puts a camera in and you're not real happy about it, uh, you can turn the camera around and aim it at a photo of a nice, empty, calm, tranquil office while the rest of you are having your Friday margarita party or whatever you may be doing. Uh, over in the studio, they're telling me that's called a Homer Simpson. I'm not sure I, I caught that episode to get the reference, but uh, that's what the guy did. I thought it was kind of cute that the employer actually put it up on Reddit and said, look what my employees did when I tried to film them. Uh, so the, there's our tip. Thank you, Mike Elgin, for... Uh, helping out with uh, employment privacy uh, issues. And then our resource of the week is from the folks over at the Sunlight Foundation. They have a pretty cool app they released that is a bit like Shazam, uh, which is the, the app that you can use to identify a musical track. If you don't know what it is, uh, it'll tell you information about it, where you can get it. Um, what Sunlight Foundation has done is... I released an app called Ad Hoc, and they have a video about it. We'll just go ahead and play for you. And other groups with innocent-sounding names, like Americans for Puppies. But would you like to know who's really paying the bill? Now you can. Ad Hoc is a new app from your trusted source for political and government data, the Sunlight Foundation. <laughs> This path-breaking app identifies the sponsors of political ads and tells you who paid for them. Ad hoc shines the light on the money pouring into our elections, so you can be an informed voter. Download <laughs> there the we app go. for Thumbs iPhone up. and Android by clicking this link and share with your friends. So you get the idea. Here in election season, it helps uh, shine a little transparency, as the Sunlight Foundation is wont to do. On the ads you may be seeing, uh, whether they're funded by... Uh, the entertainment industry or the technology industry or anybody else, you're going to be able to um, find out who's uh, <laughs> horses in that race. God, I got to get off my animal metaphors. <laughs> get off of that uh, but we'll, yes, we'll, we'll go ahead and make our second MCLE pass race for the show. Hawks, just to stick with the theme. You uh, know, I, I expect some immediate copyright litigation over that, uh, you know, because I, I looked in the developer API uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, documentation for the technology that's the, you know, the sound printing technology that underlies us like echo print or something like that. And uh -huh. it would seem like you would have to make a cached copy, even if it's just around for a little while in the, you know, in the device so that you can run the algorithms against it and evaluate what data points are there to identify the ad so that you can cross reference it in a database to figure out who's funding the ad. So don't you think that, you know, there's an infringement making that cached copy right there that you're running against. So if it's the entertainment industry, by golly, mm -hmm. that is sponsoring an ad and they are uh, being identified with the use of this app, I think they should go to court right away and uh, get this thing shut down. No doubt. No doubt. Well, nobody's sued over Shazam as far as I know. So we will uh, see if, if your tongue in cheek suggestion gets picked up and followed. Uh, but with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap the show. It has been really fun having this entertainment-oriented discussion today. And we thank our two great law professors and send them back to school uh, for joining us today on the show. Professor Lauren Mulrain, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. And Professor Ramona DeSalvo, it's been really great meeting you. Thanks. It was really fun talking with all of you. So we so appreciate your time and your insights. And Evan, so appreciate your coming back and joining us week in, week out. It's great to be here. I've enjoyed it, uh, enjoyed it a lot. Very nice to, uh, to meet you.
both of you and uh, good to talk with you, Denise. Yes, always great to talk with you. Uh, Lauren is over there on the Twitter. He is Lauren Moraine there. Uh, Evan is as well, Internet Cases and at internetcases.com. Uh, the show, of course, you can find at twit.tv slash twill with our whole archive of shows there. We're in iTunes and we'd love for you, if you listen to the show in iTunes, to go over there and give us a rating. Let us know what you think of the show and your comments and feedback there are really valuable. Um, and you can hit us up on our Facebook page and our Google Plus page where we uh, brainstorm topics for the upcoming shows. We'd love to hear from you on that front. Please email me. I'm Denise at twit.tv or Evan. He's Evan at twit.tv. We look forward to hearing from you and to seeing you next time on This Week in Law. Take care. <laughs>